Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of the Bible, this inexhaustibly fascinating and wonderful library of Holy Scripture, which by your Spirit and in fellowship together guides us, teaches us, and reveals to us your hospitality and grace. As we say the story of Damascus Road, we're reminded of your incredible power to transform lives. Lord, just as you turn Saul from a persecutor of your church into a passionate apostle, work in our hearts today. Continue to transform us too. Help us to be open to the changes you bring about to make us more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, move us, help us, illuminate this passage, grab a hold of us, And speak through my offering this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. In the book of Acts, the gospel not only crosses ethnic and geographical boundaries, but it also cuts through the most formidable barriers to fall. Human pride, spiritual blindness, and sin. If we go back to Acts chapter 5, there's a meeting of the Jewish Supreme Council called the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin had religious and civil and criminal jurisdiction over Israel. And they were holding the apostles in jail for blasphemy and for public disruption. And the most well-respected leader on the council, Saul's old professor, Rabbi Gamaliel, advised the elders to let the apostles go. He said, if their gospel is of human origin, it'll fail. But if it's from the Lord Almighty, God help us all, because you will not be able to stop these men. And he went on to say, you will only find yourselves fighting against God. Acts chapter 5, verse 39. So Luke writes that they let them go after they were beaten with with whips and shamboks and rods. You can imagine them bleeding, bent over in pain. And they ordered the apostles to stop talking about Jesus. But when they were released and back on the street, Scripture says they rejoiced because they were counted worthy of suffering for Jesus. They couldn't be stopped. Well, a beating wasn't good enough for Saul. He was an ambitious, super religious, full of himself, prideful young Pharisee out for blood. And he was doing everything he could to stamp out Christianity. And we pick up the story where we left off last week with the conversion and baptism of our Ethiopian brother uh, by Philip uh, with verse 1. Let me read it to us again. Follow along. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he could, so if he found any there belonging to the way, that's the reference to people that follow Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. Verse 1 and 2. Two Sundays ago, we looked at the murder of the first Christian martyr, a deacon named Stephen. Saul was there. Those responsible put their coats down at his feet. It says that he was consenting to the execution. Amazing that such a man was converted in such an amazing way. He was pursuing Christians across the border to drag them back. He he was out there on a spiritually blind mission to hunt them down and bring them to justice. But the hunter became the hunted. The text says, without warning, Saul got lit up, knocked down to the ground. Now, there's no mention of, of a horse, of him riding a horse. It's often assumed that he went airborne. But there he is, lying in the dirt, 
arms raised high. Saul had a close encounter with the king of the world, Jesus Christ. So see him lying there, shaking without sight. And verse 4, he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When we see or hear something terrifying or confusing, the brain undergoes a dramatic and intense reaction. Uh, imagine the brain as a city plunged into chaos. The moment you detect an unsettling stimulus, the sensory information races to the thalamus, the brain's central relay station. From here, the data is urgently, urgently dispatched to various regions of the body. With what's seen, the optic lobe connected to the retinas of the eyes becomes hyperactive, translating the disturbing images. A sudden onset of an intense migraine headache can cause temporary blindness. With what's heard, the temporal lobes burst into action, interpreting the sounds, maxing out processing capacity. The prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for complex thoughts and decision-making, works overtime, creating a sense of dread and unease. And the hypothalamus struggles to process and make sense of the experience, searing the sights and the sounds in one's mind. This flurry of neural activity creates a, a sense of overwhelming fear and confusion. The brain in its intricate complexities transforms these unsettling sights and sounds into a visceral experience, a moment of acute distress that reverberates throughout the entire body, leaving a lasting impression. Now, these are modern science ideas, but I want us to, to see and feel what he might have experienced. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul cries. <laughs> he would have preferred any other response, right? Any other name than the one he receives. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In his pride, in his spiritual blindness, what we call sins of the flesh, Saul realizes he himself opposes God himself. On that road, flat on his back, he learns firsthand Jesus is the Messiah, and he also learns how closely Jesus identifies with his church. Saul, you are persecuting me. In persecuting the people of the way of Jesus, the, the bride of Christ, Saul was persecuting Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Saul was at his worst, his lowest. Years later, as he often will recount this life-transforming events, he refers to himself as the worst of sinners. He showed no sign of repentance or remorse for what he had, had done, and yet, in that state of sinfulness, out there hunting people down, Jesus arrests him on the Damascus Road. At least three things must have crossed his mind. Number one, Jesus of Nazareth was who he said he was. And second, he now knew he was playing on the wrong team, persecuting God's chosen people. And third, he was about to be judged for his own sins. He knew his Bible. He knew his Bible. According to one of many verses I could look at with you, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14 says this, quote, God will bring every deed into judgment 
with every secret thing, good and evil. So he knew only the morally good will be resurrected. But he was headed for the lowest next world. But by God's grace, that didn't happen. Jesus told him instead to get up, go to the city, and await instructions. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. It says, look at verse 7, it says that they heard the sound, but they, they didn't see anyone. He'll recount this event and share his testimonies elsewhere in Acts chapter 22, in Acts chapter 26. Uh, perhaps Jesus spoke in Aramaic, which Saul would have known, but his company did not. But the verse says in verse 8 and 9, they got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind, did not eat or drink anything. Blinded by the magnificence of Christ, his physical blindness allowed him to see himself truly. He finally recognized his own weakness. He had come to the end of himself. I wonder, have you come to the end of yourself? See it's only after being brought to abject humility that he's ready for the uplifting gospel of hospitality and grace. For Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Matthew 5, 3. James 4, 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And he's been humbled. He no longer sees himself as someone great, the smartest, the most accomplished, the most certain about his future. He now saw himself as he was, someone who needed to be completely changed. Many times I've had the joy of, of discipling someone in, in Christian discipleship. Uh, and one of, one of the signs... Every time, as I thought about this week, of the different men in my life that I've discipled into faith in Jesus, every time there's a, the same sign of changing spirituality, spiritually. Do you know what it is? There is always a season of them feeling miserable. That's right, there, there is always a season of them feeling miserable. Miserable. That's right. Every man I've discipled to become a genuine Jesus following disciple goes through a miserable stage. They feel very unhappy before they are filled again with joy. In John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, a Christian allegory written in 1678, the main character is called Christian. It's a Christian allegory. And he's often depicted uh, as very unhappy due to the weight that he's carrying on his back, like a giant backpack, which symbolizes Christian's guilt and the sin that he carries. And this great burden causes him distress and unease and makes him feel spiritually and emotionally heavy. Why does Christian feel unhappiness? Well, for starters, number one, he's acutely aware of his own sinfulness and the consequences of his sin, that he has been offending God, his offense against God, which creates profound sense of, of guilt and sorrow. Number two, he, he deeply is yearning for salvation and, and assurance of eternal life. And that, and that yearning that's unanswered causes him anxiety as he fears for his soul. And number three, throughout his journey, Christian faces numerous trials and temptations that challenge his newfound faith. 
contributing to his overall sense of unhappiness. Get to the end of the story. Christian's unhappiness diminishes as he progresses on his journey, receiving guidance and encouragement and ultimately finding solace in the hope of salvation and the promise of reaching the celestial city. This all points back to our text. Saul is in a miserable state. He can't see. He's lost his appetite until the most amazing turn of events. Let's continue reading. Look at verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on the straight street and ask for a a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Uh, Lord, answered Ananias, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my, what? Chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias is an unsung hero of the faith. Imagine how he must have felt when the Lord directed him to go help a man who was responsible for the murder of his friends and family. Ananias personally knew widows and orphans because of Saul. Lord, he must have said, Lord, seriously? He's come here to arrest us and worse. Notice in the text, the Lord not only saves Saul, but also chooses Saul. Look again at the text. This man is my chosen instrument. He must suffer for my name. Another amazing thing happens. An example of radical hospitality. It says, Ananias went and found Saul, and he placed his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Wow. He calls the murderer of his friends brother. He says to him, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you sent me so you may see again and may be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the text goes on to say something like skills fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. That he got up, that he was baptized, he ate, he regained his strength, and almost overnight he begins preaching boldly about the resurrection of Christ. And it says that his brothers and sisters in Damascus look after him and even protect him from the crowds. Ananias plays a crucial role in Saul's conversion experience. Through his obedience, he becomes a conduit through which the Holy Spirit imparts healing and fills Saul and sets him on his mission. This act of of laying hands symbolizes acceptance, commissioning, and affirmation within the fellowship of believers. It's amazing. But what does this amazing story of resurrection presence, hospitality, grace, what does it mean 
for you, for me, for Village Church today. There are insights for our personal faith journey that I want to challenge us with here, and there are lessons we ought to hold to and continue to apply and live by as a church on God's mission. First, you don't have to have such a dramatic testimony of conversion as we read today. Does that free us up? You do not have to have such a dramatic testimony of conversion as we read today. But genuine biblical transformation, the Greek word for repentance is uh, metanoia, in every instance in Scripture signifies a profound change of the mind and the heart. A profound change. It involved, it involves a radical transformation of one's entire being, worldview, and life direction. Saul's encounter with Jesus on the road is the most amazing example. A shift from persecutor of Christians to becoming an apostle and a Christian missionary. Like his experience, metanoia involves personal encounter with Jesus Christ. It is transformative. It leads you to reevaluate your beliefs, your values, your priorities in the light of the gospel. And it's initiated by the Holy Spirit. That's why I prayed at the beginning, Holy Spirit, move us, help us, grab a hold of us. Has the Spirit grabbed a hold of you? Has your life changed because of the gospel? Or has it just been added on to however you were living and thinking and believing beforehand? Christians are saved by grace through faith. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary that Jesus died to pay for it. However, the reality is, in Scripture, there are many professors of faith that aren't possessors of saving faith. I hope that comes through translation. Those who speak with their lips but deny it in their heart. I'll wait for our translators. Forgive me. Jesus says, even the demons believe and shudder. And then he says in Matthew 7, many will say, Lord, Lord, and he will look at them and say, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. The question is, how do I know if my faith is legitimate? And the Bible gives three tests by which we can understand for ourselves if we truly follow the Lord, if we are truly following the Lord. The first is love for Jesus. Do you actually love Jesus? We sing all morning. Do you love the one we sing to? The second is, does that love manifest? Does it, does it, is it shown in your life by obedience to his word? Do you love Jesus? And do you do what he tells you to do? Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So love of Jesus and, and living by what he says. And the third is a love for God's people. We see here in the obedience of Ananias, a love for God's people. Jesus said, love one another. By this, they will all know that you are my disciples if you've loved one another, John 13. Do you love other Christians? The Bible is very clear that faith always produces a tangible evidence and that evidence in believers' lives is love for Jesus, obedience to his word, and the love for each other. The encounter he had on the Damascus Road forever changed Saul, who we later will go by what name? Paul. He wrote of it a number of times. 
One example was some 20 years later, he's writing to the house churches in Galatia. He wrote this. He says of God, quote, God set him apart in his mother's womb and called him by his grace. Galatians 1.15. He also wrote in his first letter to his young protege, Timothy, that before he met Jesus on the road, Paul himself was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. And then he says this. Here's it on the screen. 1 Timothy 1, 13 to 16. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason. Listen, what's the reason? That in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were, who were to believe in him for eternal life. God had chosen him before he was born. God could have prevented him from these murderous sins sooner. Why did he not? It's a mystery. Yet in one sense, it was this. Listen. For all who fear, they are too far gone to be saved. That's why God didn't stop him sooner. It was for anyone who thinks they might have sinned themselves out of grace. Who thinks, I don't love Jesus enough, or follow his word enough, or care about others enough to earn his love. Look at Paul. Look at the overflowing hospitality and grace shown to him. This is offered to y'all. Now. And what are the lessons for Village Church? The lessons are vital and urgent, so please listen closely. We must be all about the radical, transformative power of the gospel. Amen? This involves a renewed emphasis on personal and collective encounters with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We cannot peddle in an easy, softened, watered-down message that says, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's what a lot of churches who often want to attract new people to their church only say. Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. My friends, if you've studied the Bible, you know that's not what the apostles preached in their gospel. Find what Peter or Paul or any of the apostles in the book of Acts were preaching in public that saw thousands upon thousands come to Christ in saving faith and grew the church and planted house church after house church spread out like wildfire across the empire. It started riots in the streets that caused all kinds of trouble for the state. Find for me where it says that their message was, Jesus loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. You will not find it. They didn't pander to people's pride, spiritual blindness, and sin. Nor should we. Nor will we. The way the apostles proclaimed the good news was to say things like this. Acts 17, 30, and 31. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, this man, from the dead. The early church leaders went to public places and said, 
You are a sinner, and so am I. This is what he accomplished when he died on the cross and rose again. He's paid for sin. He is now redeeming and reconciling the world to himself. Repent and believe the gospel. Church, then and now, is to call people, you and me and everyone, to submit themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, trusting him, turning away from sin, and believing in him and receiving the gifts of eternal life. This is how the apostles preach the good news. Would they even recognize what is communicated most Sundays, or what passes for evangelism these days. What drove Paul and the apostles, the sent ones, should drive us too. God's people are out there. They just have not yet met Jesus yet. They're out there. They're hurting, lost, and confused. And sending us out is God's means of reaching them. No one is too far from his resurrection presence of hospitality and grace. No one is too far gone, amen? He can arrest and grab a hold of anyone, anywhere, and at any time. If it was left up to me to try to convince someone that Jesus is Lord, I think I would have given up long ago by now. Or I, I would have watered down the truth to, to make the message easier to accept w without making people feel unhappy and unsettled. I like people to feel happy and settled. But we know God's people are out there. And sharing this message and demonstrating God's love by loving acts of mercy and then inviting people to explore faith in Jesus is his means of reaching them. It doesn't matter then what someone has said or done or their lifestyle or their allegiances. God can and does touch a person's heart and changes them. And our job is to show people everywhere the love of God and to honestly and plainly share with them good news, and then make them disciples. So Village Church, we must continue to prioritize equipping and empowering and raising up disciple-making disciples of Jesus. Paul writes this, his second letter uh, to the church in Corinth. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Where do we go from here? Let's go to prayer. Let us examine our hearts. How is the Lord working in your mind and your heart right now? What is coming to mind and in your thoughts? right now. Bring that to him in prayer. Who or whom is he bringing to your mind right now? Is there someone you're thinking about right now, maybe a family member or a friend or neighbor who doesn't know Jesus? Bring that person to him in prayer. I want to gently add and speak slowly for our translators. One more prompt before we pray. Is there a fellow brother or sister in Christ that you need to change your heart posture towards? That is to say, the way you think about them, the way you consider someone who doesn't think the way you do. Is there someone like that? Bring them to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning of worship. We thank you for the reminder of your hospitality and grace 
as in the life and testimony of the Apostle Paul. As he was once a blasphemer and a persecutor, but was transformed by your mercy, so also we acknowledge our need for your mercy and transformation. Lord, even now, right now, fill us with your Holy Spirit and change us. Lord, we are humbled by the realization that you chose to work through imperfect vessels like us. Thank you for entrusting us with the gospel and for considering us faithful to your service. We pray for that person or persons we're thinking about right now who don't know you, Jesus. Help us to walk in obedience to your word and to extend your love to all around us, especially our brothers and sisters here. And we ask for your continued guidance a village church. Fill us, your church, with your spirit that we may go into all the world spreading the gospel in the precious name of Jesus we pray and all God's children said, Amen. 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 Amen, young one.